You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach. I feel this urgency every morning when I wake up, and it's like the clock is ticking down, the deadline is upon us. Oh, it's kind of an unsettling and agitating feeling. Do you feel that way too? And you know, the election is almost here, but when the election happens, we're not going to know really the result for a while. It could take weeks. It could take months. There'll be anger. There'll be betrayal. There'll be riots and demonstrations. Was it a legitimate election? Was it not? Are we going to file those permits to go live in Portugal like everybody else has been talking about? But will people really do it? Who knows? And then, of course, Things aren't going to change immediately. It's going to take months and months. It's Let's say that Joe Biden wins the election. Then he's got to get into the White House. That's the end of January. Then he's got to start pulling levers and appointing people and undoing things. It's really, it's it's going to be a long process before we feel anything resembling ease. That's what I think. And also, we're now headed into a new wave of COVID infections, I think, or a new spike. So it's just, this is not the end, and it's not the beginning, and it's maybe the middle of the beginning. Uh, Who knows? We don't know what's in store. But yet, you have to have moments of utter banality. I mean, how does my hair look? That's a question I ask myself now that I look at myself on Zooms. I've never looked at myself so much in my whole life until this. Uh, Should I have eaten those potato chips? Why do I have so many paper cuts on my fingers? Should I buy an iPad? I mean, we can't live like it's the urgency, like life is at its extremes every day. We can't do it. We have to take a breath, whether it's meditation, which I still don't do, or reading a fashion magazine. I don't know, is fashion still a thing? Or watching a rerun of a show you like that will calm you down, or reorganizing your spice rack or your sock drawer. Sometimes you just need a mindless activity. Now, I have discussed in other podcasts my profound appreciation for dogged and great investigative reporters, women and men who will not stop at anything, at obstacles, until they've gotten to the bottom of the things they're investigating. And in a way, I have two of such reporters on the show today. One is Joe Connison, an old friend of mine from my days at The Village Voice, who has been an investigative journalist for 42 years. But there he worked often in tandem with Wayne Barrett, who was a legendary investigative reporter, who is not here today because he died the night before Trump was inaugurated, but he dedicated years and years of his life to looking into the boasts and the reality and the cognitive dissonances of Donald Trump. And a lot of journalists who have written about Trump in the last four years have been using Wayne Barrett's investigations as their sort of foundational work. Joe Connison has written for the New York and been an editor for the New York Observer in addition to about 12 years at the Village Voice. He's written books about Bill Clinton and George Bush. He joins me today to talk about the new book, Without Compromise, the brave journalism that first exposed Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and the American epidemic of corruption, the work of Wayne Barrett. The book was edited by Eileen Murky, and Joe contributed to the book. And so I feel like I'm bringing two smart and principled reporters to you all today. But first, my five things that make my life better. Number one, my new made well jeans. Now, I am deluged with ads for new blue jeans on all my social media. And I imagine the reason for that is I open them. And once you open them, you get them and you get more and more and more. But I decided very passionately that I needed to replace an old pair of vintage Levi corduroy bells that now in my memory were my favorite pants of my life. I don't know why I got rid of them. Probably at the time they weren't my favorite pants, but I've decided I needed new high-waisted bootleg jeans. Madewell makes them in denim. I got them. 
They arrived about six days ago. I have barely taken them off. I'm wearing them right now, actually. And it reminds me, I see all these fancy, expensive jeans. I don't understand why somebody would spend $300 on jeans. Madewells just fit me well, and they are usually just a little over $100, which, you know, is a lot of money to spend on jeans. I admit it, but I feel they flatter me. Number two. The Vow, the documentary series on HBO. It's about Nexium, the cult that was kind of a hybrid between self help and sex slavery, if you can sort of match those two. I still don't understand how this guy, Keith Ranieri, pivoted from self help to get all that you want and you're entitled to, to having slaves to pleasure him. And so far, I haven't seen that in The Vow. And I can't wait to see it. Anyway, so far, what I've seen is former members of this cult, Nexium, are trying to get current members to leave the cult and to understand how dangerous and brainwashy it is. And Catherine Oxenberg, a British American actress who was in Dynasty a million years ago, animates a lot of this because her daughter is in the cult and a lot of what you see is her trying to get her daughter out of it. Anyway, it's fascinating. But now that we have a cultish president, I am trying to understand how cults really work and how people talk themselves into thinking that whatever they're getting from it is helpful or healthy. And this guy is a nebbish and he's the head of a cult like so many of the others. They're the Wizard of Oz. Just curious. Number three, speaking of cults, the word game that I discovered a few years ago on the New York Times puzzle site, Spelling Bee, has grown a cult around it. It's not just me. And in fact, I don't think I've gotten appropriate credit for being one of the first people to write about this game. Anyway, there is a cult around it now, people who are rabid fans. And I am linking you on my website, lisabernbach.com, to an adorable article about the cult of Spelling Bee. And whether you play the game or not, I think you'll like the article. Number four. Politics Making Strange Bedfellows. I had no idea that some of the people I follow and retweet on Twitter are Republicans, but it doesn't matter to me anymore. Who is Rex Chapman? I never heard of him. Turns out, I guess he's famous, a former basketball player, a star player, maybe a famous drug addict. Well, I follow him too. He's retweetable in my book. So it is interesting who ends up being in your digital virtual world, isn't it? And number five, Nancy Pelosi. Whether you admire her as I do or not, she is a force with which to be reckoned. She wears her masks. She shows up. She's stubborn. She cares about passing laws and acts that will help those who are in extremists these days of the pandemic and unemployment. She may not be in the news every day, but we can't forget that every day she's doing her work day in, day out. And she's grandma's age, you know? Coming up, Joe Connison. Don't go away. It's Lisa Birnbach. Welcome back to the broadcast. My guest today is an old friend and colleague from The Village Voice, which we will get to very shortly. His name is Joe Connison. You may have seen him on TV, where he is often one of the smart people who's asked to talk about, oh, corruption of various kinds, particularly political. He is the editor-at-large at Type Investigations. He's the author of many books, and he has written the foreword to a new book that's really important and really actually kind of as disturbing as it is charming. I don't say that about any books. It's called Without Compromise, The Brave Journalism That First Exposed Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and the American Epidemic of Corruption. It's the collected works of crusading truth finder Wayne Barrett, who was a great Village Voice investigative journalist. Welcome, Joe. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to talk to you. And I'm really happy that this book brought us together again because, you know, you and I both worked at the Village Voice in 1979. But 
I, I never really was part of your world. I was in the sort of feature world and it always felt like you and Jack Newfield and Wayne Barrett were doing this important stuff while people in my office were testing bongs. <laughs> um, <laughs> what I love about this book is the painstaking nature of investigative journalism, which is described and uncovered by Wayne Barrett. He was like a mentor to you, right? So Wayne and Wayne was older than I was, but we came to the paper at the same time. And it was after a while that I discovered how much more Wayne knew about the world than I did. I was 24 at the time. He was already in his 30s. And we both were mentored by Jack Newfield, uh, mm -hmm. who had been at the paper for a while by then and was kind of the chief investigative and political reporter and editor at The Voice when I got there. And Jack sort of recruited me and, and Wayne. And as I say in the preface to the book, Wayne had already been doing a type of investigative journalism on his own in Brownsville, where he moved for years. Uh, Wait, could you just explain Brownsville, Brooklyn in the 1970s, where he um, had moved from the South? Yes. So he had gone to Columbia Journalism right. School. And then in order to escape the draft, as I recall, he signed up to teach in a public school in Brownsville which was one of the most impoverished and depressed African-American neighborhoods in New York. And he moved there with his wife, Fran, and lived there for many years. And one of the things he did while he was there, besides teach school, was to start a little mimeograph newspaper. Because in neighborhoods like that, there is no newspaper or any media that serves. Any local, public, right. Right. So. I, I'm not going to make you describe mimeograph. <laughs> Continue, no. please. Uh, it was, uh, <laughs> yes, a primitive primitive form of copy. <laughs> yes. So even primitive form of email, even kids. more primitive than an, than a Xerox machine, which you also don't remember. <laughs> right. So, um, anyway, yes, uh, it was, it involved a drum and ink and anyway, but it was, a but he was just doing this out of citizenship. Correct. He was doing it because, well, Frankly, he had been radicalized at Columbia. This was a kid who'd grown up in Lynchburg, Virginia, conservative Catholic family, Republicans. He'd supported Barry Goldwater in 1964. Right. And then went to St. Joe's in Philadelphia and became radicalized there. Anti-war, long hair, all of that. No marijuana or any of that kind of thing. Wayne was very straight in that way. Right. But, but very left wing. And when he got to Brownsville, he saw, you know, just the grossest possible injustice in American life, you know, right. and, and really wanted to do something about it. And teaching school was one thing and being active in school politics and all of that was one aspect, but he'd always been interested in journalism. He'd been the editor of the high school newspaper in Lynchburg, the home of Jerry Falwell, by the way. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so he had a knack for journalism and he had an interest in journalism and he had gone to journalism school and he put all of that to work in Brownsville, running a little publication called The People's Voice in what is now, to me, recognizably sort of 60s jargon of the left. But, right. but it was The People's Voice in a lot of ways. And his exposés of school board and other local corruption caught Jack's eye eventually. I'm not sure how exactly. I mean, we knew, you know, at The Voice, we knew politicians in those neighborhoods, and somebody must have told Jack about Wayne at some point. And Wayne started writing stories for The Voice and then got recruited onto the staff around the same time that I did. Now, for all those who weren't aware of The Village Voice and its impact in the world in the late 70s, well, all 70s and 80s, it was a weekly newspaper that was very much about the writer. The editors were, you know, our editor, David Schneiderman, wasn't an ideologue as far as I knew. It was really a place to let good writing and reporting flourish. Yes. I mean, David, I have to say, was a great editor in a lot of ways. One being that he protected us from Rupert Murdoch, who was the owner at the time, mm -hmm. and wanted to uh, try to fire me. And I later found out David refused to do it and probably turned back a lot of other stuff that Murdoch had tried to do, like our incessant criticism of the New York Post, which he also... Right, uh, right. <laughs> But yes, it was a writer's paper. And as I also say in the preface, I mean, we in the political uh, section, the sort of front of the paper, were very much free to pursue our 
obsessions, our causes, Mm -hmm. our views. And Wayne was as dogged about this as anybody. And the paper was known for investigative reporting. I mean, it it was, that was sort of our our calling card, one of our calling cards as a publication was that we did these long investigations and that many of them eventually got picked up by the, what we called the straight press. Right. Now in 1979, Wayne Barrett (laughs) started following a brash local real estate developer named Donald Trump. And in one of the pieces excerpted in the book, Without Compromise, you see the beginning of Trump's M.O., in dealing with the press. He dodges them. He tries to woo them. He says, you're going to be good to me. We're going to have a friendship after this article comes out. I mean, (laughs) the slimy stuff that he does now, he started doing as a 32-year-old. He lied about his responsibilities at the Trump organization. His father would show up with him at hearings. I mean, it's all there. It is all there. And it's remarkable, Lisa. And when Wayne died on the night before Trump was inaugurated as president. Wait, let, w- oh. that is just one of the worst things ever, isn't it? Yes, it was terrible. I was with him the day before in the hospital and it was it was awful. But oh. yes, you perspicaciously see in these stories the Trump who took shape before our eyes in the last few years. And Wayne had his number, mm-hmm. uh, you know, more than 40 years ago. And you see Trump, you know, swearing to one thing in one proceeding and swearing to the opposite in another proceeding, and it's all on the record and he gets away with it. You see him basically offer to bribe Wayne. He found out that yes. Wayne lived in Brownsville, which was, as he says, a very tough neighborhood. And, you know, I could get you an apartment very easily. Oh, apartment. I, it's shocking. But, <laughs> but let's talk about the form of the journalism. Here is, you know, there are a lot of journalists who turn themselves into the story. Right. That's been going on since, I guess, the 60s. And here's Wayne writing about this offer from Donald Trump, also writing about sitting in the uh, urban development office, going through records, also talking about then going to a hearing, and yet he's not in the story somehow. He, in a way, and I also like calling his work stories because they're beautifully written narratives. They're not just exclamations and they're not, it's hard to describe. It's not not punditry. It's not punditry and it's not gotchas. It's really how the story lays itself (laughs) out. And some of these stories were pretty long, right? For the Village Voice? They were very long. We would, I mean- What was the average word count? You know- I, Wayne would fight for every word. I mean, I had to. Edit. He and I did a column together in the front of the paper for a few years, which was local and sort of national news that we mostly wrote. And I had to edit him, and it was just horrible because <laughs> he, would, he would battle over every single word. Which I I'm not like that as a writer. I actually appreciate editing. Wayne did not. Uh, mm. He saw editors as he would say they're you know from office temporaries. Like we're here, <laughs> and uh, and there was some truth to that. But you know I think they're as as edited. I will say they come out very well. I mean he would stop speaking to me for days because I took a word out of something. And oh my I god, to, that's I'd have to call up his house. We live three blocks from each other in Brooklyn. I'd have to call up his house and you know. And I would say to Fran, his wife, can you please tell Wayne this about this story and this about that? Because he would not come to the phone because I had tried to edit him. So he sulked. He sulked. He would sulk. He was, he could, I mean, you know, it, that's just, and then he'd be as if nothing happened, of course, but uh, in a few days or maybe a couple of days. But in any case, he didn't love being edited because he wanted you to know the whole story. He really thought it was important that you know all the facts that you know, the incidents. And he also, as you said, he didn't see himself as an important figure in the story. The things that happened, I mean, there's a story in in the book about a guy named Ramon Velez from the Bronx, Uh who was the original poverty pimp, if you've ever heard that expression. This guy made millions of dollars basically looting programs for the poor in the Bronx with the help of, or at least the assent of politicians in the community and in the state. And when Wayne went to investigate him in Puerto Rico, he tried to kill Wayne and uh, assaulted him, tried to strangle him. 
And later, well, when, we went, when we went to uh, an event in the Bronx where he was present, I was with Wayne. He and his goons tried to assault us there, and somebody fortunately stopped them before they could wow. rough us up. But <laughs> this is all described in the book, too. Right. So, yeah, I mean, he and he describes these incidents and his incidents with Trump and the fact that Trump, who then had Roy Cohn as his lawyer, threatened, yeah. threatened to sue him, and he was going to sick Roy Cohn on him and spend $100,000 to you know ruin him as he had done to other journalists, supposedly all these threats. And Wayne is just, it just rolls off of him, all of it. You know, he is just pushing forward and he does. And with a moral clarity and and just a work ethic that were just remarkable. Do you think that because he was at the Village Voice and stayed despite higher paying offers to go other places, do you think that's why Wayne Barrett today is not as famous as Bob Woodward or Carl Bernstein? Well, I mean, Watergate was special. Those guys were very lucky, and they were also very good. I know Carl pretty well, and I admire them for that work. It's a different kind of situation. Also, Wayne didn't have the good fortune to have Alice Mayhew, the saint. <laughs> yes, it's Simon, Simon and Schuster, Schuster. As, as, uh, as his book editor, the way Woodward has uh, until she passed away last year. But she was my editor there, too, and I you know, she ah. did wonders for Woodward. But yes, if Wayne had gone somewhere else, he might have become very famous because he was that good, but he would not have had the freedom that he cherished. And so I think he was he was happy with what he had done. Uh, I think he wasn't happy to see Trump becoming president, but he right. was, I think he felt satisfied that he had had the kind of career and work life that, you know, that he wanted uh, and that he could only have in a place like The Voice. Not at the Let's, Times or any of those other places where, you know, editors, there are editors and they're not from office temporaries and they're, right. they're going to they, you in. So Yeah, exactly. He used a phrase about Donald Trump that I'd like to explore. And he, of course, sort of got the number of Rudy Giuliani, too. Eventually. He talked about moral larceny. Yes. You know, it's such a great phrase because it's not enough to win a deal, to lie about what your per footage rent is. price will be or yeah. rent will be and know that you've gotten away with murder. You know, it wasn't enough to cut a good deal. You had to also then be a creep. You had to be evil. You had to do something that just made everybody sick to their stomach. This is what, you know, Trump's niece talks about in her book. Uh, Mary yeah. Trump, who was a, a big fan of Wayne and cites Wayne in that book. This, I, I don't know what else to call it except mental illness, but it is a, a particular kind of pathology where Trump needs to lie. He needs to deceive people. He needs to swindle people if he can. And it's writ large on our country now in yeah. a way that is, you know, I'm worried is permanently damaging, but certainly has harmed thousands and thousands of people. I think it's why so many people are dead from this virus. Yeah. Uh, and Wayne saw through that from the very beginning. And that's why some of these stories in here are so revealing. You know, he didn't become famous, Lisa, but in our profession, you know, in my world, he's famous. Yes. He, yes. He is a legend. And, right. And all of the journalists who came after him, the people you you know about, you see them on TV, you know, the Maggie Habermans and the, the David K. Johnstons and all these mm -hmm. people who are on the tube all the time talking about Trump. They'll all tell you, I learned from Wayne. Mm -hmm. It was Wayne. Mm -hmm. I followed Wayne. And, and to some extent, Jack, too. But Wayne taught us about Trump. And we follow in the pathways, as I say in the preface, that he blazed. They all went down those lanes looking mm -hmm. into the stuff that Wayne had revealed. And, you know, they would before the election, uh, the last election, there was like a line of pilgrims to Wayne's house in, in Brooklyn, wow. in Windsor Terrace, because he had these enormous files in the basement there. He lived in a <laughs> brownstone in Windsor Terrace, which is, you know where it is. It's near Prospect Park. And they would all come. And, and look at his files. There is a picture of the files in the book yeah. that almost gave me shingles. <laughs> I, I, it, it scared me so much. The piles and piles and piles of folders, which had to have been organized daily, it looks like. If anybody had taken one out of the pile, you know, West Side Railroad Yards, <laughs> yeah. you'd we'd have to fall. put it back. Yeah. Yeah. Or they'd all tumble. It, yeah. It was very mysterious to me how Wayne 
kept things organized. He was very meticulous about the tasks that he did. He would always write things down on a yellow legal pad, and he'd have a long list of stuff that had to be done for any story. But he also had, as we mentioned in the book, and always comes up about him, he had a core of interns. Yes. Uh, unpaid in the nasty old way that we did in those days, getting college credit. Many of them came from Columbia, and he had hundreds of them. Uh, I, you know, I uh, there have been at least 100 counted and found, but there are more, and who, some of whom have gone on to great careers themselves. You know, Jen Gonerman, who writes for The New Yorker now and is a really respected reporter, was a Wayne intern. Uh -huh. uh, she has an essay in the book about working for Wayne. Yeah. Um, and they helped to keep it all together. Uh, right. So, so that was part of it. But yes, so the files now, which cover more than Trump, they're, you know, about Giuliani and uh, lots of other disreputable people are now at a, an archive at the University of Texas in Austin. Right. And Eileen Markey, who edited this book, actually had to go down to Austin, Texas, right? To yes, she go did. through them. Yes. Eileen yeah. was also a Wayne intern. She did a fantastic right. job with this book. She's a great journalist in her own right. And uh, she did. She went to the Briscoe archives at UT and you know, spent many hours going through those papers to make sure that she understood all of Wayne's, you know, methods and techniques before she tried to put the book together. You call or she calls someone in this book refers to, I think it's you, refer to Wayne Barrett as the people's detective. I think I've been talking on this podcast about investigative journalists, real journalists who aren't the kind who Again, not punditry, right. not people who get their news from tweets, but people who actually dig and delve and what a tough job it is. And, and, you know, I'm thinking of our contemporaries at the Village Voice and at other, let's say, less than well paying newspapers. And, you know, you have to do the job because you feel almost a moral imperative. There's no glamour. There's the thrill of, discovering a connection to something you thought maybe to something you found, you know, following a hunch, but there's no, there's no winning, especially if you uncover something crummy. It's just, it's just proof that something crummy is going well, on. So th the thing about Wayne was that he really stuck to it. And as you said, for reasons about self-fulfillment and fulfilling right. a, what you considered a duty to society. And yes, he, he, he called himself the people's detective. He said that we are referring to Jack, me, him, every, you know, Tom Robbins, all the people who did this in our shop and elsewhere as the people's detectives. We are, as he said, paid to tell the truth and right. uh, not paid a lot, but <laughs> you're paid to tell the truth. And, you know, I've, I've done punditry and investigative journalism in my career. And I'll tell you, the punditry is a lot easier and it is what makes you famous. Right. Uh, it's what, gets you on TV and, you know, it's rare to see an investigative reporter go on television. Now a little bit more on MSNBC, they'll put some of them on. But in those days, no, you didn't get asked to go on television. No. And, and Wayne was not, you know, a glamorous type. No. So he, I, I never I saw him on TV. That, or but, well, he, he would get on New York one after towards the later years, he was on New York one. New York one is a local cable station. Right. Our, right. Our, very good local cable station. And one of the people who was close to Wayne was Errol Lewis, who's the sort of ah. political voice of New York One. And he would have Wayne on because Wayne knew so much about local politics. I mean, he yeah. really did. He was actually capable of being a very you know, astute pundit when he wanted to be. He understood how elections worked and uh, all of that. But it's true. You know, it could be very thankless. We spent months, the three of us, investigating Alphonse D'Amato, the former New York senator who was... Who was nicknamed Senator Pothole because he just did favors for his constituents right. in also, exchange for, I think, something called money. Yes. He was also called Senator Sleaze. We spent months oh, yeah. investigating him. I, I was out in, you know, he was from Nassau County uh, on Long Island. Long Island spent yeah. a lot of time out there, and so did Wayne, uh, looking into his various sleazy deals and his ties to the mafia and all the rest. And he won. He won the election, mm. uh, which was against Elizabeth Holtzman, who was one of the best members of Congress ever. And, and she was on the um, House Judiciary Committee during Watergate. She was, indeed. And so... You could see how, you know, unrewarding this work could be. Mm. On the other hand, 20 years later, 
Wayne was still investigating D'Amato, and he helped to, <laughs> to oust him when he was right. thrown out in 1998. So, yeah. you know, it's if you have the iron butt that Wayne did, where you'll do the work forever, no matter what, then, you know, it has its own rewards. I guess that's the beauty of the long view, or you say iron, but my father would have called that zitzfleisch. But Zitzfleisch. Yeah, exactly. So Joe, since you're the guest and you have a whole interesting story of your own that we can't, huh, I really want to talk to you another time about- next book, okay? Definitely for your I'm, next I'm, book. I'm but, working on one now, so- well, Oh, excellent. Yeah. Do you want to say what it's about? Uh, yes. Well, it's it's appropriate to this. It's about how the Republican Party became the party of grifters and con men. Oh, that's I'll be here for that. I know you'll be there for that. I know you. Yeah. Y- yeah, absolutely. And oh, my gosh, it certainly has. And, you know, we're two and a half weeks away from the election. I'm still unpacking the fact that NBC invited Donald Trump to have his own hour by himself as a reward while he insulted them yes while he called them concast and made fun of every i I mean he's just uh anyway um but you well okay let's go to your five things and let's just hope that our audience will hunger for more of this conversation another time either when your book comes out or before that would be great i would love it i just want to say that We both also overlapped a little bit at Spy Magazine, and you were the one who wrote the article about George H.W. Bush and his extramarital extramarital life, and that's an important story that never really got its due, and it's not because he had a girlfriend. It's because it was, you didn't get sued for it. No. I mean, that's a thing. People that, thought. Yeah, every word of that story was true. And I came very right. close to finding somebody who he clearly had had an affair with. But, you know, it's funny. So, Kurt Anderson, who I know is a friend of yours, uh, mm-hmm. he's been a guest uh, here too, signed that story to me at Spy. I'd never written for Spy before, but they wanted an investigative reporter to go <laughs> investigate Bush because the Republicans were trying to make Clinton's extramarital. Right. Misconduct. The issue. issue. Yeah. Right. So the answer was, well, why should the hypocritical Republicans get away with this? And I agreed with that. I will say, and I did, I thought a credible job on that story. And they, the spy people were so clever. They contrived to have a copy of that issue, which it was the cover story on every seat in the Democratic convention in Madison Square Garden. Wow. The day that it came out. So wow. it, got, it got a fair amount of attention. And uh, the Bushes, I'm afraid, never forgave me for that. But I came to have, you know, I guess as we all have, a different view of them over the years because of my writing about Bill Clinton, uh-huh. and Clinton's relationship with them which was based on, you know, humanitarian work that was real. And I did a lot of reporting about that. And their affection was genuine their affection for one was another. Totally genuine. And both Listen. Bushes did a lot of good. I mean, George W. Bush and I opposed him on Iraq and he probably still hates me, but he saved millions of lives with Clinton on what was called the President's Emergency Program for AIDS research and AIDS funding. And they spent billions to save people's lives with generic medicine and he never gets any credit for that. So that was listen, a right thing now to look back on your work, you know, and yes, about what yes. You've done. Incredible. Well, in the prism of Donald Trump, George W. Bush looks like a lovely man. They both, they both, <laughs> a genius. They, well, they both do. Yeah. <laughs> both tr- yes, they look like wonderful people and humanitarians. Okay, Joe, it's time for your five things because even when you're a busy investigative reporter, you still have a life sometimes. So let's start with your number one thing. My number one thing is something called Pro Razo shaving cream. And if you go to to Europe, well, it, particularly in England, you'll sometimes see the best barbershops have a green and white awning. And it's because they use Pro Razo products to give you a shave. And anyway, it's the best shaving cream. I got Jesse Kornbluth, who another yes. mutual pal of ours, uh-huh. to promote this shaving cream on Head Butler after he used it. Oh, yes. You, just the best shave. And when we're in lockdown and you can't go to a barber, at least you have the satisfaction of giving yourself a decent shave at home with this excellent, excellent shaving cream. So, you know what? 
I, I think everybody gets it. Yeah. About like you have to be kind to yourself or have a little something to look forward to during this weird time. Exactly. This so isolating weird time. I recommend it if you can mail order it or you may be able to find it at a suitably sort of high tone pharmacy, but it's worth it and it just feels better. I used it this morning to get ready for this interview, even though I knew it be on camera, I shaved. For you, Lisa, and oh, and Joe, I could. I just got a little free song <laughs> of something. <laughs> so uh, it's worth it, exactly, Pro Rosso. Exactly. Uh, so Pro okay. Rosso shaving cream. It comes in different types, but you will find the kind you like. Uh, number two. Number two is CBD oil and balm, and they're two separate things. I know lots of people listening have probably used CBD products or their precursors. Uh huh. But so I there's a West Coast branch of my family that's in the CBD business producing CBD oil. And uh huh. They were in New York at the gift show and they were had testers and we had dinner with them. They anyway they said I said, you know, I'm looking for something that will help me sleep better. And they said, Oh, try this. And I tried it and it works. And not only does it make you sleep better if if you can, you know, I, maybe it doesn't work for everybody, but I know lots of people it has. But the balm combined with the sleep oil will actually relieve, like if you have sort of chronic pain in some part of your body, your knee or your hand or something like that, the combination of the two actually works. And uh, and it's totally harmless, uh, as you know. Um, how do you apply it? It's topical? So the CBD oil for sleeping, you put under your tongue. Uh-huh. It's, a, it's a tincture of CBD. And some of them have some THC in them also. I mean, it depends which one you get. Nothing wrong with that either uh, at bedtime. And the balm is just, uh, it's a cream and has other that things That you in put it. on your aches. You can put it on any place that aches, like, you know, like icy hot stuff. Oh yeah. You know what? You just said one of my favorite words, ding, 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 tincture. Yes. That is such a good word. Not a nice word. So, <laughs> well, tinct so tincture is what people make from cannabis. Oh, I thought you can have a tincture of elderberry or a tincture. Oh, yes. oh sure. yeah. Yes, you can have yeah. a tincture of any plant uh, or herb. But when people are trying to turn cannabis leaves into something that's usable in a in cooking or in these medicines, they make it into a tincture first. Well, because it's so fun to say. Number three. Number three is Avatar, The Last Airbender, which is a TV series that I'm watching with my family. And, you know, it stands for something bigger, which is that in lockdown, we've spent a lot of time watching movies and, and TV shows with our kids. And, you know, I guess everybody does that, but it's a way of really learning about your children and, you know, creating stronger relationships with them. When you share this, I mean, Avatar: The Last Airbender is a is an animated show, and it's not necessarily something I would have watched at my age by myself. But to have that kind of relationship with the kids, where you know, my daughter is very creative and she draws and she writes. Say, Dad, I want you to watch this animated show with me. This is, I think, this is the best show on TV. Is ah, and then it's it's, it's bonding. Yes, bonding exactly. It's really fun. And it happens to well, be a really good show. Luckily, my kids have good taste and the show's <laughs> really, really good. I recommend it just as fun to watch. But it's just part of being cooped up, you know, together right. and learning about each other. We did a long, many nights watching Marvel Comics Universe movies. And, you know, we had Harry Potter at different times. And right. All, you know, they all have, well, in my view, they all have this kind of undertone of being stories about fascism, which seem appropriate right now. But yeah, uh, yeah, uh, and very they're allegories, but um, very strong on good and evil, right? Correct. Um, also, your kids are thirteen. Your twins are thirteen, which is an age. It's a great age to to capture with them because you know soon they won't Other talk to you. Are coming, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So so build up your bank of goodwill right now. Well, so this is why. Yes, so I'm anticipating that because I have lots of friends with older kids and see where that goes. And my experience watching other families is that if you do this, then yes, there's a period of alienation and separation, and but then they come back. If you teach them to like you early enough, uh, yes. then, then they come back and then everything is, is good again. Our kids are, are great. And, and your number four is also about your kids. 
Yeah. So number four is sailing on the Sunfish and uh, another boat called the Quest with my son, Edward, who is uh, an excellent sailor like his sister. They're both uh, sort of elite sailors. They're on the racing team here in Nantucket where we come in the summer and they're just very skilled. And so it's a thrill to go out in a boat with either of them. I have done it more with Edward because my wife is usually on the boat with Eleanor. But just to see the skill that they've developed and the independence and the competence as young sailors is is just thrilling. And of course, being on the water is you know, such a wonderful part of life. We're so fortunate to be where we are and to be here with the kids. And anyway, it was uplifting. Some of the best parts of the summer. And we only stopped sailing like last week or the week before. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, that sounds lovely. And your final thing I've heard at number five is the Instant Pot. Yeah. Now what's the duo? Instant Pot duo. Oh, okay. I mean, there are different types of Instant Pots and you know, people can get whatever one suits them. So right now we've spent months away from our home in Manhattan. We are, we came to Nantucket and we didn't leave. And I don't want to dwell on that because we're so lucky that it could make people mad at us. But just to say, we're here in a house that did not have a lot of the stuff that I usually use to cook. I'm the cook mostly in the family. And I relied on my pressure cooker at home to make all kinds of stuff. We, we, don't eat much meat. We eat a lot of beans and soups and stuff like that that I that the pressure cooker is great for. But the Instant Pot is like a pressure cooker that you don't have to watch. And when you have you know, a lot of work to do and you have kids who are being schooled remotely and there's quite a bit of cooking to do because you can't go out very much, right. the Instant Pot is just fantastically good. And it helped me learn to overcome my aversion to anything that's too techy in the kitchen. You know, I'm I have the opposite problem. I'm scared of my Instapot. I bought it. Um, we're not friends yet. You know, maybe this winter we'll have another chance. Well but last year it it blew its top at me, literally. Oh really? That's yeah. not good. Uh, no. That's bad. <laughs> Did you did you mess around with the little pressure valve in some way that caused the problem? Uh, well, I didn't think I had, but I must have. But well, you we, know, we can have uh, a tutorial uh, off air about this. Oh, a Zoom tutorial. <laughs> oh, that would be great. I would love that. I I need somebody to just walk me through it in English, not in cooking. I would be honored. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Joe, it's been a real treat catching up with you and more to come. And just a wonderful tribute to Wayne Barrett, the wonderful journalist with whom you work. Again, the book is called Without Compromise, the brave journalism that first exposed Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and the American epidemic of corruption. It was edited by Eileen Markey. And of course, it features investigations by the people's detective, Wayne Barrett. You've been listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. My guest today has been reporter, editor, writer, and chef Joe Connison. His book is available through Bold Type Books, and you can find it online. We will put pictures to all the things we talked about today on my website at lisabernbach.com. My podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Kevin Watkins. My team is Michael Port, Spresso, Rucha, Boko, Haft, and Sam Haft. Until next week, wear a mask, stay home. Act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers.